Yeah. Is my screen visible? Hello? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. So uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, hypoglycemia and diabetes looking beyond the usual suspects. And I think uh, there's no more topic which is more relevant to uh, physicians uh, and for uh, endocrinologists because this is something which you need to recognize. And if you don't, you might lead to uh, catastrophic uh, consequences of the same. Now, what's the basic idea of this talk? Right? So if you see broadly, right, uh, you know, we have hypoglycemia in patients uh, having diabetes, right, which is what we all recognize, know uh, everything about that. And then there is hypoglycemia in patients not having diabetes, right? So what we're going to do today is somewhere in the middle, right? That is patients having diabetes, but having hypoglycemia, which is not usually seen in patients with diabetes, right? So it is because of some other cause. And that is what we are going to look at. And that is the uh, amalgamation of these two things. Now, approach to a patient with hypoglycemia and not having diabetes is a complex subject. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, if, if you do find a patient with that, the most important thing uh, as a physician uh, is to look at the Whipple's triad. I apologize for this busy slide, but the point is that, as you can see, the idea of showing this slide is the complexity involved in uh, diagnosing and assessing a patient with hypoglycemia who is not having diabetes. It's a complex condition. And again, that is where the role of endocrinologist is very, very crucial. Uh, again, you know, this is another slide showing the complexity involved. Again, I don't, uh, you know, the idea is not to really uh, you know, uh, neither to uh, really scare you about the process, nor is it to really, uh, you know, uh, just just brush it aside, but to tell you that approach to a patient uh, in hi uh, to hypoglycemia in patients not having diabetes is a complex process, which requires, uh, you know, a detailed evaluation and learning. Uh, you can read about more about that in patients not having diabetes, because that's, li like I said, not a subject today. Uh, by reading this notes, uh, or this is a notes in endocrinology, you can use a QR code. And you can read, uh, you can see the, uh, you know, these, these so-called uh, perhaps complex, uh, you know, algorithms of flowcharts we have made. Uh, you can have a look at that. And, uh, you know, I think the best idea is that when you see a patient with hypoglycemia not having diabetes, that patient requires a uh, referral to an endocrinologist uh, ASAP. So now let's look at uh, hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes, but unusual causes. So we are going to look at briefly about Causes of hypoglycemia, which are usually, usually not seen in patients with diabetes, and that is what we'll be looking at. And what I've done is I've tried to uh, simplify this by looking at two clinical cases. Again, like I said, it's a complex disorder, but there are two cases which I feel are extremely essential and which should not be missed. And I think that is where the patients really need to be uh, looking at and, uh, you know, uh, clinicians need to be really uh, be aware of these conditions and probably consider referring it to endocrinologists at an appropriate moment. So let's look at the first case. So this is a very interesting patient, a 67 year old female. She's having type 2 diabetes and she's on a glycoside extended release with metformin one gram. And she's having an HbA1c of 7.2%, right? So she's, uh, well, uh, you know, not excellent control, but reasonably well controlled uh, diabetic on glycoside with metformin. Now, she was also having diabetic neuropathy and a cousin of hers from a foreign country. Uh, you know, if you, if you have seen in the US, there are big vitamin shops so a cousin of hers, uh, you know, probably from the US, uh, bought a vitamin, bought this medication, alpha lipoic acid. Uh, this is available in India as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, bought a big bottle of this, uh, which contains 600 milligram of alpha lipoic acid. And uh, she said that, you know, uh, uh, well, this helped me for my diabetic neuropathy. So perhaps it could help you as well. So this patient started on this uh, uh, over-the-counter vitamin uh, from, you know, and has been taking it, had been taking it for a few weeks before we saw her. Now, uh, in fact, not a few weeks. In fact, within a couple of days after starting the medicine, patient came to the emergency with level 3 hypoglycemia. What is level 3 hypoglycemia? As you'd be aware, level 3 hypoglycemia is something that requires assistance of somebody for, uh, you know, recovering from hypoglycemia. These are terminologies which are used by American Diabetes Association. So she had a level 3 hypoglycemia. When she came in the emergency, uh, a glucose value was 33 milligram per deciliter. Now, if you are an emergency care physician, or if you are a critical care physician, uh, or if you look at patients in emergencies, uh, there is something you can really do to help your endocrinology colleagues is to take a critical sample. And this is something we have taught our ER doctors. And uh, thankfully, it's working pretty well that, you know, whenever you have a patient coming with hypoglycemia, you take a sample, right? Uh, we'll tell you what test to send. You give us a call, but you take a sample. And that was something which is very cr uh, crucial. The creatinine at that time was 1.1 with EGFR of 55, which uh, in which she falls into category 3A of mildly reduced CFR and the hypoglycemia was of course corrected in the emergency and the patient was then admitted for further evaluation because there was an unusual cause of hypoglycemia and something you know they uh, you know wanted to see and the endocrinologist uh, saw this patient 
uh, the next day morning, right? So when we saw the patient, we had the critical sample available with us. Now, I often see uh, physicians sending investigations uh, randomly or investigations in the morning, fasting, uh, you know, sending insulin and C-peptide levels. And these patients are then referred to us saying that the insulin level is high, C-peptide is high, so on and so forth. What is very important to understand that in endocrinology, everything is in context. So when you analyze something, it is in the context of, you know, what the potential diagnosis is and what is the potential physiological state. So this sample was sent when the glucose value was 33, right? So that is something you have to understand and you have to interpret in the context of glucose being uh, low, right? So glucose was 33 and at this point of time, uh, this investigation was sent. So uh, just uh, think this in your mind. Uh, the cortisol level was 22 microgram per deciliter, right? Uh, I apologize for the error here. Uh, it's 22 microgram per deciliter. And uh, what do you think? Is this cortisol normal, high, low, right? So when you have hypoglycemia, remember the uh, cortisol level is supposed to increase, right? And this probably can be considered reasonably fine, right? So when the patient had hypoglycemia, uh, cortisol more than 20, uh, perhaps even 18 can be considered reasonably okay. But what is very interesting is these two things, the C-peptide and insulin, right? And the first line of defense against hypoglycemia is uh, a patient having, uh, you know, uh, 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 should, you know, the insulin level should reduce, right? And that is something which is the first line of defense against uh, diabetes and in a human physiological state. But you can see here, uh, anything which is detected, frankly, right? A C-peptide, uh, you can see the values are pretty high here. But if anything that is detected, uh, you know, uh, generally it's more than three is considered for insulin and more than 0.6 nanogram per ml for C-peptide is considered high, you can see values are much, much higher than that. And a beta hydroxybutyrate was sent, which was suppressed. Now, remember again, uh, what this suggests is that the insulin is active on the body and the beta hydroxybutyrate was suppressed, right? So the beta hydroxybutyrate is a ketone. So what this tells us is that you are dealing with a case of what is known as insulin dependent hypoglycemia, right? Now, this is not unusual at all, right? In this patient, why? Because what was the diagnosis? This patient probably, you know, obviously we think of a common things first, right? So in this patient where you have uh, insulin dependent hypoglycemia in a patient who is taking sulfonylurea, a long acting one, the most likely uh, etiology you have to look at is sulfonylurea induced hypoglycemia, even though we know the fact that liclazide is less likely to produce hypoglycemia, nonetheless hypoglycemia is still possible. And hence, you know, our first three differential diagnosis will still be sulfonylurea induced, uh, induced hypoglycemia and anything else is perhaps less likely. So everything else is perhaps secondary and what you really need to look at is SU induced hypoglycemia. So that is what we considered. So we discontinued the SU uh, in the fact that, you know, she had reasonably good control. Perhaps you could consider giving other drugs. Uh, and the, this uh, hypoglycemia event uh, looked like perhaps uh, what, what, you know, was precipitated by a sulfonylurea uh, apart from anything else, right? There were unusual reasons why this patient should have suddenly develop this. But then, you know, uh, we thought of, uh, you know, the Occam's uh, razor that, you know, the most likely condition is the most likely condition, right? So uh, that is what we did. We discharged this patient on Ecarbos with metformin three times a day. And the patient was discharged with a reasonably well uh, managed uh, sugars, the fasting of 105 post meal of 178, which is, you can say, reasonably well controlled, right? Now, the patient comes back in emergency, uh, 3 p.m. the next day uh, with level 2 hypoglycemia, which is where the sugar was 52. The sugar was low, but at the same time, you know, the patient was conscious and uh, could, you know, of course, uh, take something, but she preferred to come to the emergency. Uh, a uh, few days before that, she had stopped taking her ecarbos and metformin, uh, you know, uh, and interestingly, the hypoglycemia here was postprandial, right, which is very interesting to note here, right? So earlier, the hypoglycemia was middle of the night, but here it was postprandial hypoglycemia. And she has been having several episodes of mainly postprandial hypoglycemia in the past week since the discontinuation of ecarbos, which is interesting. After discontinuation of the drug, the patient had this. So again, you had uh, these crucial, interesting factors. And again, a time critical sample was taken and hypoglycemia was uh, corrected. And then the patient was uh, referred to me at that point of time. Again, the critical sample showed something very interesting. The cortisol level is 23. The C-peptide is 21. And you can see insulin levels are very, very high, right? Now, what this tells us, again, this has to be suppressed, right? But remember, now this patient is not on a sulfonylurea. She's not on ICU. In fact, she's not on any medications for diabetes. Uh, yet she developed hypoglycemia. And yet the insulin and C-peptide were not suppressed, which is kind of interesting, right? And it tells us that, you know, perhaps we need to look at an unusual situation. Right? That is where, you know, uh, your, your Sherlock Holmes hat really comes into, you know, a uh, uh, picture, right? So now our differential diagnosis was something called insulin autoimmune syndrome. Now, you know, again, uh, what you need to understand here is that, remember, the C-peptide in insulin was not suppressed, right? This is insulin-dependent hypoglycemia, right? So again, you had uh, C-peptide in insulin should have been suppressed, which was not. 
And hence, you're looking at something which is unusual in this case, right? We also calculate something known as insulin uh, C-peptide molar ratio. Uh, again, you know, uh, we need not be aware of this condition, but remember, the interesting thing is that this molar ratio uh, gives us a clue of whether we are dealing with an insulin autoimmune syndrome or we are dealing with insulinoma, which is another important differential diagnosis in this condition, right? But there are reasons why we considered insulin autoimmune syndrome in this patient. Uh, the reasons were the insulin C-peptide molar ratio was more than one. Uh, if you uh, see the patient had mainly postprandial hypoglycemia and patient was on ALA, which is, uh, you know, we thought about this for the first time, but I think, you know, we, we just let it go. Uh, but the second time, you know, this was very, very, uh, you know, apparent that there was something to do with ALA. So we, uh, that point of time, our differential diagnosis was insulin autoimmune syndrome. We reviewed the patient's medication again and found that ALA was still she's taking. We sent an insulin antibody titer, which was high. We, of course, did a CT uh, pancreatic protocol as well to rule out an insulinoma. Uh, perhaps may not be enough to rule out insulinoma, but at, at this point of time, you know, uh, it was normal. Uh, so we thought of an insulin autoimmune syndrome, right? So we discontinued the ALA and restarted the patient on the acarbose and metformin. And we discharged the patient uh, once there were no further episodes of hypoglycemia. And, uh, you know, uh, we asked her to avoid uh, you know, told her what medicines not to take, right? So this is something which we did, right? Now the patient was on close follow-up, right? The patient did not develop any further episodes of hypoglycemia after discontinuation of her, uh, you know, uh, ALA, right? Which again uh, is something interesting and I'll come to this point in a minute, right? So this is this is what happened and eventually the patient was doing well and HPVC was close to 7% and with a carbose and metformin, right? So, uh, you know, uh, we forgot about this patient, patient, you know, uh, kept coming once and while but then came for a routine health checkup uh, after some time and you know uh, for that uh, you know the physician pres uh, prescribed her something to, uh, you know containing b12 that's what she told the patient came back again with hypoglycemia similar to the uh, episode earlier again in the late afternoon right so again after starting some medication she had this issue right now again we reviewed her medication and now, now that uh, you know so-called uh, multivitamin had 200 milligram of alpha lipoic acid again we discontinued the medicine and observed the patient and send her back and send her very strictly saying that you need to avoid alpha lipoic acid, right? So why alpha lipoic acid is important and why we thought of this condition, that is what we're going to discuss in the next few slides. So what you need to understand is a condition called insulin autoimmune syndrome. It's a rare disorder where you have antibodies against insulin leading to increase insulin action and hypoglycemia. So this is what happens as a picture from, uh, uh, you know, uh, NEJM. There's a very nice uh, uh, post after dinner hypoglycemia article in NEJM, right? So what happens is, that, you know, after meal, you have increased insulin release and this really insulin binds with an insulin uh, antibody, right, which creates a complex. So by binding this, what happens is that the insulin level often, uh, you know, uh, uh, the postprandial insulin level drops. But suddenly after some time, there is a spontaneous dissociation of this. And this suddenly, now at this point of time, the glucose level, uh, you can see has already dipped, but the insulin level suddenly spikes up. And at this point of time, the patient develops hypoglycemia. And typically, this hypoglycemic episodes tend to be postprandial. Right. So this is what is known as insulin autoimmune syndrome. This is a very important condition and must be recognized. And it is it is not uncommon in Asians. Right. So which commonly used drugs lead to insulin autoimmune syndrome? It is also known as Hirata's disease because Hirata first recognized this in Japanese population. In fact, it is very common in Japanese. It is relatively less common in uh, Caucasians uh, in India. You know, we don't have the exact prevalence, but it probably is not that uncommon. Uh, now, it is very well known to be caused by carbimazole and methimazole, but what we don't uh, often forget is the second most common cause is alpha lipoic acid. And this is something which you have to be aware of, right? So again, if you have a patient like this, you know, you need to look at the review of the medications and look at alpha lipoic acid. It can be caused by clopidogrel. So in fact, we had another patient who had clopidogrel. This, of course, you know, you don't include here because it's a non-diabetic patient, but, you know, clopidogrel is known to cause and your other favorite drugs, pentoprazole, omeprazole, uh, you know, also often lead to this condition. So these are the various commonly used drugs which can potentially lead to insulin autoimmune syndrome. Now, it is strongly linked with uh, this particular HLA, it's, which is more common in Asians, and this disease is more common in Asian population, right? And what you need to do is you need to, of course, stop the offending medication. And generally, uh, you know, uh, it often starts four to six weeks after starting the offending medication and often resolves also within a few weeks after starting it, right? Now, the test you can send is an insulin antibody, autoantibody, which is an IgG antibody you can send, right? And uh, the other three situations, you know, like I said, you know, uh, how to differentiate this between from an insulinoma. Well, insulinoma can produce both fasting and postprandial hypoglycemia, though, of course, this is fasting. But insulin autoimmune syndrome mainly leads to postprandial hypoglycemia. You often have associated conditions like perhaps some drug which the patient is taking and there is a prior history of exposure to drug, which is very important. Uh, you can see the serum insulin levels are very high, often more than 1000, as you saw in this patient also. Uh, here, the insulin levels are high, but perhaps less than 1000. And this is where insulin to C-peptide ratio 
clearly comes into picture. The abdominal imaging may is generally normal here. Uh, here you could find a lesion in a pancreas, but of course if the lesion is uh, is a pancreas uh, CT is negative, you can go for a exendin scan or a gallium rotorox scan uh, here, right? It's a self limiting condition, whereas uh, insulinoma requires excision, right? So this is the insulin autoimmune syndrome. Uh, you can look at these references and the one particular reference I really, there are two references which you should consider seeing. One is by, uh, you know, uh, Boro et al. This is from India, right? A very nicely written article. In fact, this table which I showed you is written by them. Uh, so you need to uh, go to them. And the other very interesting one is uh, the one I showed you from NEJM that is called After, Dip, After Dinner Dip, uh, which is uh, from New England Journal of Medicine. So these are good references you can perhaps look at. Uh, again, uh, there are many other drugs which can potentially cause hypoglycemia, uh, not because of insulin autoimmune syndrome, but because of other reasons. There are two drugs which I feel you should consider knowing is fluoroquinolones and tramadol. Again, these are two commonly used drugs. Now, among fluoroquinolones, voxifloxacin is associated with highest risk of hypoglycemia and ciprofloxacin with least risk of dysglycemia. Leofloxacin comes second after moxie. And you can see from this uh, uh, correlation of hypoglycemia uh, with fluoroquinolone use uh, in this slide here. Uh, so it can lead to dysglycemia. So it can lead to both hyper as well as hypoglycemia, but hypoglycemia risk is higher and that is something you should be aware and again, uh, be reasoned, right? Now we don't exactly know the reason for hypoglycemia in this condition, but perhaps it is because of the potassium channels which are involved in this process. Uh, another drug, especially in emergency, can lead to hypoglycemia is tramadol. Again, uh, some people develop restlessness and agitation after giving tramadol and according to a you know a, a emergency care journal, uh, a article by Senthil Kumaran says that Perhaps it is because of hypoglycemia. In fact, they, they you know, took these patients who developed restlessness after giving tramadol and found that they had hypoglycemia, right? There's something interesting. There's another study which has also shown that tramadol is, is causally linked with hypoglycemia in hospitalized patients. So that is something you should be aware about. So now let's look at the second case, right? Uh, again, something very important. I'll go a little quickly because, you know, I'm running short of time, but I'll, I'll just breeze through this. So it's a 45-year-old male patient. He was, on, he was having type 2 diabetes on basal insulin, glimepiride, and multiple OADs. Uh, he presented for the first time to us an emergency with level 3 hypoglycemia with a random sugar of 40. HbA1c was 5.8. That tells us that there was, you know, probably a very tightly controlled or some, you know, issue. Creatinine was 1. Sodium was 116. This is very important, right? And again, critical sample was sent for analysis. Now, hypoglycemia was corrected and critical sample was sent for analysis. And on gaining consciousness, the patient revealed that he had severe headache a few hours before he was brought to ER. Worst headache of his life. And the patient had stopped his diabetes medicine seven days before because of weakness, loss of appetite and so on. A patient also history, has history of primary infertility and erectile dysfunction and he was actually divorced five years back uh, perhaps because of this reason. So we did a critical sample analysis where the glucose level was 38. The cortisol was 7. Now this is you know this lab would report this as normal right but what you have to understand that patient's glucose was 38 and this cortisol should have been raised. Uh, we also suspected this so we sent a GH also right we generally don't send GH in adults but you know you did this. Remember, this is again, it's more than 10 is considered to be normal. It was 1.2. So it is reported as normal. But remember, it's not normal in this situation. But here you can see the insulin and C-peptide levels were significantly suppressed. They were literally undetectable. And if you're dealing with a condition which is insulin-independent hypoglycemia, and that is something you need to be aware about, right? So we did an MRI for this patient. And you can see, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps you can see this here. You can see uh, the white uh, lesion here. This is blood, right? So this patient has a large pituitary adenoma with an intra-lesional uh, bleed, right? So this, what this patient had was secondary adrenal insufficiency with possible panhypopituitarism leading because of pituitary apoplexy, which led to the hypoglycemia. And this condition, right, a hypoglycemia in a patient because of panhypopituitarism is a condition which is known as Hauser's phenomena, right? This is a very, uh, you know, uh, it used to be very famous at one point of time. We often forgot about this condition. It's called the Hauser phenomena. Uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency is a very important cause of hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes. I think this, of all the lessons which I'm going to learn today, I think this is the most important thing. And if you recognize this and refer it to your endocrinologist, trust me, the life of your patient is going to be remarkably changed, right? You can have both, uh, you can have all three, primary, secondary, and tertiary adrenal insufficiency in patients with diabetes. Primary adrenal insufficiency is because of adrenal pathology. Secondary is because of pituitary and tertiary is because of hypothalamus or CRH deficiency. Uh, primary adrenal insufficiency is often autoimmune, but tuberculosis is also an important cause. Right? And autoimmune primary adrenal insufficiency can happen in patients with type 1 diabetes and you have adrenal insufficiency with hypothyroidism or and or type 1 diabetes is known as autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome, APS type 2 or Schmidt syndrome. Right? If you have a paper on Schmidt syndrome, uh, uh, published in uh, you know, uh, thyroid research in practice, so you can review that uh, more about it. Uh, 
so you know this is a cgm uh, uh, report where they found that you know perhaps you can predict primary atrial insufficiency where you tend to have a you know so the sugars are high here but suddenly early morning time there is a dip in the sugar and this type of presentation could you could perhaps suspect uh, primary atrial insufficiency and in patients with type 1 diabetes uh, so if your patients are on cgm you should be aware of this potential condition and look at this now secondary atrial insufficiency is secondary to pituitary dysfunction uh, it's called secondary atrial insufficiency and correction of you know diabetes and hypoglycemia uh, uh, or hypo, uh, hyperglycemia in patients with or uh, uh, in, in, you know this is known as hausse phenomena as we discussed and this was named after argentine physiologist called bernardo hausse actually won a nobel prize in 1947 in fact he did the studies in dogs where he removed the pituitary and found that their uh, diabetes went into remission which is very interesting however this idea thankfully never caught on as a treatment for diabetes uh, of course secondary atrial insufficiency can happen because of pituitary surgery so all perioperative pituitary surgery is need to be seen by endocrinologist this is very 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 important uh, it can happen because of patients undergoing cranial radiotherapy in women it can be because of shehan syndrome head injury can cause this pituitary apoplexy can cause this and uh, we have some uh, you know reports from uh, india where you had viper snake bite also leading to uh, pan hyperpituitarism uh, leading to hypoglycemia right uh, again this is a very interesting case by pramanik et al uh, by uh, his group from uh, uh, you know from kolkata where they uh, discuss hausse phenomena they talked about a patient having pan hypopituitarism leading to remission of diabetes you can see this article this patient actually had type 2 diabetes had severe diarrhea which led to dehydration which led to adenohypophyseal hypo uh, vasospasm that led to pituitary infarct that led to hypopituitarism that led to secondary atrial insufficiency patient presented with hypoglycemia it's a very interesting article you can go through this uh, in your spare time and then tertiary atrial insufficiency is because of hypothalamus pathology uh, the in fact the most important cause here is however exogenous glucocorticoid use where the suppression comes from the hypothalamus so improper withdrawal a rapid withdrawal of glucocorticoids in a patient with long standing glucocorticoids use can lead to hypoglycemia remember a lot of these patients may have steroid induced hypoglycemia or steroid induced diabetes and hence you know you need to be very careful about this and it's very commonly seen in diabetic patients so you have to be very careful about this condition uh, just to sum up some other unusual causes uh, celiac disease in type 1 diabetes is very important right and untreated celiac disease remember again uh, patients can start developing hypoglycemia if they have celiac disease we had again one uh, a slightly older patient who presented with this and we had you know she had severe celiac disease and just correcting you know gluten giving her a gluten free diet uh, improved her uh, outcome dramatically right so this is something important it's very uh, rewarding as well uh, insulinoma also can happen in patients with diabetes and that you should be aware of this uh, and and you know we have papers about this as well and uh, dr sanjay kalra and dr rakesh shah and dr unikrishan sir uh, published this uh, hypoglycemia side of hypothyroidism where they argue that some patients with hypothyroidism also have hypoglycemic symptoms right this is something which perhaps you need to look at so just to summarize uh, three key points non diabetic drugs can produce hypoglycemia fluoroquinolone is very important and some drugs like ala methimazole ppis or clopidogrel can precipitate a auto insulin autoimmune syndrome adrenal insufficiency is a very important cause of unexplained hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes both type 1 as well as type 2 and unusual or uh, unexplained causes of hypoglycemia in patients with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes should be referred to a endocrinologist asap right this is the important point right So, for further readings, you can download our app Notes in Endocrinology. This is available in both Android and iOS uh, uh, for you. And and you know, again, uh, recognizing this patient is very rewarding, and referring them to an endocrinologist at a timely manner is something which is very very useful and important, right? So, I thank you for a patient listening, and uh, I hand it over back to the organizers for further.